go. Okay, thanks, Chris. I'm afraid I'm going to have to read this because I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground, but I'll try and keep it lively. And it probably would help if I gave you the title of the talk. I think it was something like Border Cave Reevaluated a behavioral signature of our speciation question mark so we have here a sort of summary of, of the broad outlines of homo homo's evolution evolutionary biologists don't agree on how best to define speciation but they do agree that it typically involves morphological genetic and behavioral change in 1987 Geneticists claimed that we evolved in Africa close to 200,000 years ago, in the late Middle Pleistocene, only dispersing over the last 100,000 years in the earlier Late Pleistocene, replacing other hominins. This brought to the fore a problem that's dominated human origins debate ever since, a perceived discrepancy, or even a sapient paradox between our speciation diagnosed from fossils and genetics and consensual evidence for symbolic culture. Often reduced to a distinction between modern bodies and modern minds or modern human behavior, symbolic culture is far more precise. It's this domain of shared fictions treated as objective facts that we all inhabit the possibility of the rule of law and that some things are sacred. This requires immense trust. Social anthropologists have long held that collective ritual was the mechanism that established such trust. Over the last 20 years, behavioral ecologists investigating whether group ritual and religion were evolutionary adaptations have come to share this view. We associate ritual and religion with special times and places. In evolutionary terms, the first special places were campsites, the arenas where battles to establish such trust were fought and won. And puberty rituals epitomize special times. Now in the late 80s, the earliest agreed archaeological proxies for symbolic culture were things like Hang on, sorry, the wrong place. There were things like cave paintings, sculpture, beads and burials and grave goods so associated with the European Upper Paleolithic, none ol older than about 35,000 years. With the exception of cave painting, similar if less elaborate evidence has since been found in Africa and Israel going back a little over 100,000 years. This is a Kafsa burial, adolescent with a deer's antler. A paint palette from Blombos at around 100,000. Geometric engravings on a piece of ochre also from Blombos, 75,000. And beads, perforated beads, se seashell beads also from Blombos. So symbolic culture was in place around the time some Homo sapiens left Africa. But the discrepancy paradigm remains and its duration may be as protracted as ever, as paleontologists now suggest that speciation can be diagnosed by about 300,000. The problem may be even deeper. Many Africanist archeologists think that it's not just evidence for symbolism that's lacking at around the time of our speciation, but evidence for any significant behavioral change. The period of interest is the African Middle Stone Age, or MSA, characterized by the absence of these hand axes and the presence of these points and or blades made from a variety of prepared cores. Conventionally, it lasts from about 300,000 to 40,000 years ago. But while hand axes typically disappear around 300,000, blades and points have recently been pushed back to about half a million to transitional industries such as the forest smith of interior South Africa. 
So the MSA has reverted to its original negative definition, the absence of diagnostic ESA and later Stone Age traits. It doesn't correlate with any major transition. Any, sorry, any major innovations. There have been two main responses to the perceived discrepancy. To see it as a paradox demanding some non-Darwinian explanation, such as Chomsky's cosmic ray resulting in a neural macro mutation producing language, or to attribute it to small population size and weak connectivity between groups, preventing innovations from stabilizing, thereby preventing the rapid accumulation of further innovations. Crudely, the first approach dominated the first 15 years of the discrepancy paradigm, and the second is now dominant, but neither has been particularly successful. In this context, even some Darwinians have been tempted to abandon or qualify normal science and treat our speciation as a special case, either questioning the applicability of fundamental explanatory concepts such as selection pressures and speciation, or stipulating that once cultural transmission is involved, which goes back at least to early homo at two and a half million, behavior has to be excluded from the diagnosis of speciation. Cultural transmission is simply the repertoire of social mechanisms for information trans transfer, with imitation and learning long predating language as we know it. So tonight, I'll argue that there is no discrepancy, that it's the product of flawed methods, empirical gaps, and a normally safe assumption that's unsafe in this instance. In its place, I hope to show that symbolic culture became an evolutionary stable strategy during the latter part of our speciation, and that it did so quite dramatically. I'll get there by testing an eminently refutable, precise prediction of the Earth pigment record, made 25 years ago. A shift from irregular to regular and, and ubiquitous use of red ochre or hematite in campsites should be evident by the peak of the penultimate glacial cycle between 160 and 140,000 years ago. This was derived from an abstract model of the evolution of symbolic culture that some of you will be familiar with by now. Chris Knight's sex strike model revised with Camilla Power as the female coalition, cosmetic coalitions model. To evaluate that prediction, I'll be focusing on a particular MSA culture or industry, the Petersburg of northeastern South Africa, stre stretching down to here, and neighboring Swaziland, or Eswatini as it's now called. In the second half of the talk, I'll be focusing on a particular Petersburg sequence, Border Cave, which was, until recently, the only dated Petersburg sequence. To get there, though, I'm going to have, need to say a bit more about the weaknesses of the discrepancy paradigm, the relevance of the Petersburg, our speciation, red ochre and hematite, and the model that generated the prediction. So first, flaws of the discrepancy paradigm. Methodologically, the, the perceived discrepancy is largely an artifact of archaeologists' focus on innovation a qualitative presence-absence scale of variation, rather than looking for appropriate quantitative fields of variation, which would be more consistent with evolutionary theory. The empirical gaps concern our two main bodies of MSA evidence, Southern and Eastern Africa. In Southern Africa, almost everything we've learned over the last 50 years has come from late Pleistocene rock shelter occupations younger than 130,000. According to Sarah Wirtz in a 2013 review, no spatial or chronological patterning can be identified in the early Middle Stone Age, earlier than 130,000. In Eastern Africa, 
Many more sites have been dated to the earlier Middle Pleistocene MSA. Some, like Gadimota and Kukileti in Ethiopia, have provided invaluable insights on progressive technological change. But the East African sites are overwhelmingly open sites, few of which can confidently be interpreted as campsites. In this context, it may be dangerous to assume that current understanding will necessarily be better than that than supposedly outdated interpretations. What makes the Petersburg special is that it provides the only regional cluster of early MSA campsites, cave and rock shelter sequences, several of which span the greater portion of our speciation. A good starting point for questioning the discrepancy paradigm is to take seriously the view of the Petersburg prevailing 60 to 70 years ago. Back then, Africa was considered peripheral to modern human origins debates. So little was at stake in MSA research. The Petersburg was the best understood MSA industry on the continent, provided the best case for cultural evolution, and Border Cave was the original type sequence. Since the 60s, and until very recently, the Petersburg's been neglected, while the notion of cultural evolution fell out of fashion. So let's turn to our speciation. Throughout Homo's evolution, each period of brain size increase poses the question, how were mothers to meet the costs of increasingly large-brained and more dependent offspring? Sarah Hurdy's cooperative breeding hypothesis is the main explanatory framework addressing this, this problem. And there's considerable agreement about the how, how the costs were met during the lower Pleistocene, from more than two and a half million years ago to 780,000. But there's less agreement about how they were met during the middle Pleistocene brain size increase from 780,000. In our case, Brain size increase plateaued out towards the end of the epoch between 200 and 150,000, slightly later for Neanderthals in the earlier late Pleistocene. One thing is clear. Collective hunting of medium to large animals plays an increasing role, which in our case ended up with the institution of hunter-gatherer bride service, where hunters surrender the product of their labor to in-laws. Morphologically, our speciation comprised two stages. A modern human face first appeared around 315,000, possibly related to greater reliance on cooked food, reducing the load on the jaws. But a modern globular-shaped brain case, this one down here, I don't know if you can see it because of the table, first appears 200,000 years ago. Great, thanks. This one's a classic Neanderthal, and this is an African fossil from around 400,000, arguably Homo heidelbergensis. There's a correlation between this change in brain shape and the final period of brain size increase amongst African fossils. So the globular crania are appearing here. So we're talking about this last increase here. Early Homo sapiens fossils without globularized crania have appreciably larger, we're com comparing these two figures, have appreciably larger brains than, than Homo, African Homo heidelbergensis. But when compared to later Homo sapiens with the globularized crania, there's approximately a 100 cubic centimeter difference between the two averages. So within our speciation, there appears to have been a 6% absolute increase associated with the second phase of morphological change. How was this afforded? So the sex strike model and its key prediction. <coughs> 
The model's premise is uncontentious, that this energetic burden primarily fell on mothers. But it highlights a more particular problem mothers faced. Biologically, males are interested in sex, with females likely to get pregnant. Females had already lost signs of when they were ovulating, probably with early homo, around two million years ago, making it harder for males to discriminate between them on, in this way. However, breastfeeding or visibly pregnant females, those in greatest need of animal fats, would still be discriminated against. Males would be interested in menstruation as the only reliable sign that a particular female would, be, would soon be fertile and it might pay to stick around. How were mothers to stop men picking and choosing in this way? The model concerns coalitionary strategies that evolved to address this problem. And it proposes two stages to the evolution of group ritual. The first concerns preventing would-be alpha males trying to control sexual access to fertile females. By sharing the blood around, using blood substitutes like red ochre, essentially advertising that one or more females in the group were genuinely fertile, but scrambling the information, making it harder for a would-be philanderer to identify and monopolize the genuine menstruant, while rewarding males prepared to make a longer-term investment. The ritualized signaling is still, is still context-dependent, indexical, referring to the presence of a real menstruant. But it has the we intentionality essential to symbolic culture. So the stage one pigment predictions are that initial use shouldn't predate middle Pleistocene brain size increase. So claims of ochre use a million years ago should prove groundless. An almost exclusive focus on red, preferably blood red, even if blacks or yellows are locally available. Local procurement, patchy and or irregular use, and an association with early evidence for campsites. The proposed second stage concerns final brain size increase. Remember that for our ancestors, this peaked with globularization, first seen around 200,000. Renewed stress on maternal energy budgets meant female coalitions had to secure regular, regular investment, regardless of whether any individual was cycling. This, is proposed, drove a runaway process of sexual selection with the unusual feature of both sexes being choosy. Female coalitions were demanding that males invest long-term by performing bride service. Males prepared to make this investment needed a costly ritual signal as to the quality of any particular female coalition to evaluate the support available to offspring born into it. Coalitions competed to put on the most impressive song and dance displays where quality was judged on multiple levels, including the quality of cosmetic raw materials and their aesthetic deployment. Wrapped up in the playful tease of anticipated sex was the serious message, piss off, we're on strike, and don't think of coming back without the bacon. The predicted form of this message was to invert standard Darwinian fertility signaling. We're the wrong species, the wrong sex, and this is the wrong time. The pigment predictions of this second stage to the evolution of group ritual are that the final period of brain size increase should associate with the pronounced and fairly rapid shift from a mosaic pattern of no earth pigment use irregular use or localized regular use to ubiquitous use in campsites. That where suitably red and saturated materials are locally unavailable, regional or exotic procurement is expected 
and that this shift should correlate with evidence for greater investment in campsites. When we proposed this in the mid-90s, less was known about the timing of final brain size increase. So we made a second order prediction about the shift from irregular to regular use. That in Africa, this should be evident by the coldest, driest part of the Ice Age before last, between 160 and 140,000 years ago. Shortly after what was then considered a fairly punctuated speciation, genetically inferred, close to 200,000. Our reasoning was that the effects of increased aridity would be most severe in the late dry season, when game animals had least fat, creating a reproductive bottleneck. If recently evolved Homo sapiens populations were to get through this, they had to maximize the productivity of late dry season collective hunting. This wouldn't simply have been a matter of improved hunting efficiency, but increased reliance on ritual mechanisms to motivate such hunts. South Africa provides the largest body of MSA data, much of it from long sequences in caves and rock shelters. So in the early 90s, I focused on these sites to try and test the irregular, regular pigment prediction. Preoccupied with calculating relative frequencies, my pigment descriptions were very basic. For two sites, Border Cave and Bushman Rock Shelter, I also had to provide basic data on the unreported lithic assemblages. Now this endeavor had limited success. Generalized red ochre use across the region could be shown from roughly 110,000 years ago. But it was unclear whether this was a real date or an artifact of dating uncertainties for older assemblages. Nevertheless, it did support another important prediction that symbolic culture be in place by the time of initial migration. Before re-evaluating this irregular, regular prediction in the light of subsequent developments and, better, and improved descriptions of the earliest pigments at Border Cave, I must say a bit more about red ochre and place Southern African Middle Stone Age research in some historical context. Red ochre is any earth, mineral or clay sufficiently rich in the iron oxide hematite to provide a red stain when ground or rubbed. It's as simple as that. It's the most widely used earth pigment, typically for body painting or cosmetics. Archaeologically, it's the common thread uniting the various lines of evidence currently used to infer symbolic culture from around 100,000, associated with the Shkul and Kafsa burials, the paint in the painting kit I showed, the substrate of the early geometric engravings, and as a residue on the shell beads. Before 100,000 years, it's the only repeatedly found category of material culture directly relevant to signal evolution in genus Homo. The earliest occurrences associate with the forest myth industry in South Africa's Northern Cape, going back at least half a million years, but not much more than this. In Europe, it goes back at least a quarter of a million, probably 400,000. And there's an Indian occurrence more than 300,000 years old. So all the presumed daughter lineages of Homo heidelbergensis occasionally used it. The iron, the iron oxide most frequently reported from the earliest sites in Zambia and South Africa is a glittery form of hematite called specularite. One on the top left. Ethnographically, specularite's only known use was in visual display for which it was universally highly esteemed. Parties of Australian Aborigines would travel up to 500 kilometers to get it. One of the Forest Smith specularite find sites is the back of Vandervert Cave, where it's pitch black. One can't avoid conjuring images of firelit ritual, with the performers glistening and red. The nearest specularite outcrops are 38 kilometers away. Putting these earliest pigments into a behavioral context 
The, small, the Fora Smith roughly dates from between half a million and 300,000 years ago, and it's the regional expression of the Acheulean to Middle Stone Age transition. Aside from the earliest pigments, it provides the earliest evidence for hafted spears. The transition is earlier and longer lasting than was thought only 10 years ago, when it was placed between 300,000 and 250,000, and assimilated into the MSA. In Europe and the Near East, comparable transitions associate with most of the early evidence for controlled use of fire. So together, these developments appear to signal the generalization of a campsite-focused form of social organization, implying that both campsites and group ritual were prerequisite to symbolic culture, but weren't sufficient to stabilize it. So now, I can turn to the MSA in the Petersburg. When John Goodwin first proposed the MSA in 1928, the Petersburg was just one of eight proposed informal variants. Sorry. Informal variants and industries or cultures in southern Africa, four of which he placed in an evolutionary sequence. Glen Gray, Glen Gray Falls, Petersburg, Still Bay, and Howison's Port, with some overall trend to more specialized tool types. Oops. Most famously including Still Bay by facial points, followed by Howison's Port backed geometric tools, which were considered transitional to the later Stone Age. The Petersburg, only known from open sites in what were then the Transvaal and Swaziland, was primarily characterized by round-based bifacial points like these. It achieved the status of a culture or industry with Berry Milan's 1945 report on Border Cave on Natal's northern border with Swaziland. This is the first time we see sites in locations like this, perched high up with commanding views of a hunting terrain, but quite difficult to get to. This suggests some improvement in logistical organizational abilities. The excavation was prompted by the accidental discovery during a local farmer's removal of the ash-rich deposits as fertilizer of a robust but modern looking partial cranium believed to have come from the MSA layers. I'll jump ahead for a moment to introduce the resolved stratigraphy and dating of the lower portion of the sequence that's resolved from this excavation and this one here. And we're just looking at the Petersburg, these four, four members here. This is the oldest Howison's Port member. There is an, yet an older Petersburg member but that hasn't been dated, which is why it's not on the chart. This, that basal six brown sand hasn't been but directly dated, but with an estimate of 227,000 on the overlying fifth white ash, it's thought to be in the order of quarter of a million years old. The cultural sequences as described by Milan started with a simple Levalois point orientated technology showing hardly any retouch. This effectively replaced the Glen Grey Falls variant. The industry developed gradually into a more refined form with the classic round based bifacial points. There followed an apparently brief period of less intense occupation with less diagnostic traits, but nevertheless important for providing an infant burial associated with a seashell pendant, the shell having come from 80 kilometers away. This layer dates to around 77,000, immediately before the Howison's port, spanning 74 to 58,000. So, so the infant burial comes from the very end of the Petersburg. MSA site reports claiming cultural evolution weren't new in, in 1945 
And four years later, Philip de Bar Tobias confirms the Petersburg pattern at Mulu's cave, up here in the, in the northern Transvaal, in a similarly perched location, up here, and here's a close-up, halfway up a cliff. But in 1957, Revel Mason put claims for cultural evolution on a new footing. He'd excavated several Petersburg site, new Petersburg sites and reanalyzed the Mulu's collections, producing a uniformly described sample of five sites and 13 excavation units. For no good reason, though, he'd excluded Border Cave. Cave of Halfs became the new Petersburg type sequence. In bed four, Above later Shulian assemblages, as with hand axes, he found an earlier expression of the Petersburg than anything previously reported, characterized by some very long blades and a heavy duty tool component. The basal estimate of quarter of a million for Border Cave suggests that Cave of Half's Bed 4 is in the order of 250 to 300,000. It was, bed four was followed by the now familiar Petersburg cultural evolutionary pattern, spanning beds five to nine, ending with an assemblage including some back geometric tools. Mason summarized his findings as a serial trend spanning earlier, middle, and later or developed phases of the Petersburg. Applied to Border Cave, the basal assemblages there should correspond to Mason's middle Petersburg. The serial trend comprised an initial almost exclusive reliance on local quartzite, rhyolite, at, uh, rhyolite lava at Border Cave, some blades up to 20 centimeters long, very few retouched formal tools. Over time, a shortening of flakes, increased frequency and variety of formal tools, increased use of non-local, finer-grained raw materials, and the appearance of pigments and ground stone in the middle and later stages, which Mason considered, quote, among the more important products of evolution in the later stages of the Petersburg culture. This last conclusion was based on the three shelter sites, Cave of Halfs, Mulu's Cave, and Olly Boomport Rock Shelter. At Cave of Halfs, it was absent in the fairly large assemblages from beds four and five, the earlier and middle fa phases of the Petersburg, while five pieces were reported for the combined bed six to nine sample spanning the, the developed Petersburg and the Housen's Port. At Mulu's Cave, a single piece associated with the middle Petersburg of bed one, multiple pieces associated with the smaller developed Petersburg assemblages of beds two and three. Oli Boomport provided, only provided developed Petersburg, but it was remarkable for huge quantities of hematite, hundreds of pieces weighing over 12 kilos. <coughs> Since Mason's groundbreaking work, it's as if time stood still for Petersburg research. There are multiple reasons for this, but I'll focus on just one. Peter Beaumont's early 1970s re-excavation of Border Cave. His main four by nine yard trench was dug so quickly that the Howison's port was initially missed. So, so a second smaller trench was opened in an area where it was known to be present. Peter revealed an important younger part of the sequence that had been missed by Milan. His dating colleague, John Furkel, pu pushing radiocarbon dating to the limits of the technique, showed that the later Stone Age didn't begin 10 to 15,000 years ago, as was widely thought in 1970, but close to 40,000 years ago, when the Middle Stone Age was thought to have begun. Furthermore, the Howison's port wasn't transitional to the LSA, but was followed by a return to a more orthodox MSA. The Howison's port provided a carbon date estimate older than 49,000, implying that the infant burial was older still. When summary findings for the whole sequence were published in 1978 and 1980, 
Peter's semi-arbitrary Petersburg samples seem to provide only weak support for Mason's serial trend. Only the shortening of flakes and blades was robustly supported. I won't go into the details here, which I'll be talking more about on Friday, but in short, it seemed as legitimate to compare Border Cave with the distance classes Rithermouth sequence on the southern Cape coast as with other Petersburg sequences. Unlike Petersburg sequences, by the late 70s, basal occupations at the coastal sites were being, <coughs> were being relatively dated to shortly after the height of the last interglacial, 125,000 years ago. So Peter hung the interpret the, the, the the technotypological and chronological interpretation of Border Cave on classes. The technotypological comparison was left very vague. The chronological linkage went unchallenged for almost 25 years. The weak support for Mason's trend didn't seem particularly important at the time. The headline claims were that both Border Cave and classes supported the presence of Homo sapiens in Africa at around 110,000, bolstering Chris Stringer's case for the out-of-Africa hypothesis of human origins. Beaumont returned to the site in 1987 and 1988 to resolve the Petersburg stratigraphy and apply new dating techniques. He excavated older deposits at the front of his main trench while Larry Todd excavated the mostly younger deposits along the south side. In the process, much larger lithic, assemblage, lithic samples were obtained, but they've never been professionally analyzed, and I remain the only person to have looked at them. Dating estimates for the three youngest Petersburg members were published in 1990. The oldest of these, fifth brown sand, fell on the cusp of the middle later, stone, middle later Pleistocene transition, implying that the two underlying layers, members, fifth white ash and sixth brown sand, were middle Pleistocene. But it was to be another 11 years before this was widely accepted, when revised estimates pushed fifth brown sand into the terminal middle Pleistocene and new estimates of 188,000 and 227,000 were obtained on the underlying, previously undated, fifth white ash. These estimates span the beginning of the penultimate glacial and the previous interglacial. Ironically, there'd been good evidence for this long chronology back in the 70s, but few were prepared to believe it. James Fremlin of Birmingham University got two experimental thermoluminescence dating estimates on different materials of around 170,000 from the bottom of the main excavation trench, but these were never published. At the same time, Carl Butzer had proposed on geomorphological grounds that the sequence went back almost 200,000 years. Peter left it very vague as to how the resolved, dated Petersburg stratigraphy of the 80s related to the semi-arbitrary but exhaustively analysed 70s samples. Nobody considered how he'd constructed those samples, relying instead on the very brief published summaries. Beaumont's master's thesis, however, provides a wealth of appendix data that allows us to reverse engineer his analysis. Together with unpublished provenance data from the resolved dated stratigraphy of adjacent squares, it's possible to show that Peter made a mistaken stratigraphic extrapolation in the 70s. Because he was working to an eight-week deadline for funded fieldwork, he didn't clear, clean, and inspect Milan's profiles before digging, relying instead on a sketch profile drawn by geologist turned paleoecologist HBS Cook. He mistook this as being down to bedrock, but it wasn't bedrock, it was just the base of the farmer's pit. <laughs> 
Two years later, Peter exposed Milan's profiles down to bedrock and realized the significance. So this is the chocolate colored earth at the base of the previous drawing. And this is the older deposits revealed when he cleaned the profiles. And he realized the significance of this thick white ash horizon that contained, um, yeah, a thick white ash member beneath the chocolate earth that had contained the youngest normal Petersburg. Beaumont called this fourth white ash and extrapolated, extrapolated it across four yards of unknown deposit into a much thinner ash horizon in his own trench. This lower part of his sequence had been dug by arbitrary spits rather than stratigraphically. So a redefinition of excavation aggregates was required. But he did this surreptitiously rather than acknowledging the change. The thin white ash band eventually proved to be, a considerably, to, to be in a considerably older part of the sequence. But this had cascade effects on the analysis and the conclusions. The stratigraphic mistake was compounded by unnecessary over-reduction of his data, grouping raw materials, tool forms, and core forms into higher level, more generic categories. Now that might be useful if you're looking for measures of central tendency, but if you're just interested in raw frequencies, it's inappropriate. And this hid a whole suite of technotypological changes that I won't go into. But I must draw attention to the most consequential merger, the cut and paste of the two separate 1970 trenches into one continuous sequence. Because of the mistaken extrapolation of fourth white ash, Beaumont treated all three semi-arbitrary Petersburg aggregates in the truncated sequence of excavation 3B, the smaller excavation, as older than the basal aggregate in the main trench, basal complex A. So yeah, he, call, he called the Petersburg aggregates in the small excavation basal complex D, C, and B, D, D being at the bottom. And he called the basal aggregate in the main trench base uh, back OA. For some analyses, this was compa compounded, further compounded, by combining the back OB and back OA samples. The supposedly continuous sequence actually comprised two partially overlapping sequences. And the dislocation masked complementary trends in both. So that on the top, the top two, we're looking at formal tools. Back OD at the bottom, back OC, back OB. This is excavation 3B. Same pattern, but you've just got two units in, ex in the main excavation area. And this is looking at the frequency of pigment. Uh, you shouldn't make any, anything of this difference between back OD and back OC here. It's just due to different uh, overall sample sizes and, and just dealing with single pieces of pigment. So they have a, a big effect. Larry Todd's excavation 4A, this, this one, in 1987, sorry, forced Beaumont to recognize his earlier mistake. But he couldn't afford to admit it, as it would mean analyzing the new lithic collections, something he wasn't prepared to do. So the discrepancy was covered up. There was another reason for saying little about the new excavations. Most of the samples from the two oldest members, fifth white ash and sixth brown sand, came from excavations in breach of his permit conditions. <laughs> Since 2015, a new team has been conducting a fifth round of excavation, but restricted to tiny slots of deposit. Now this will undoubtedly provide a wealth of new technological and environmental information. But rare material culture categories, like formal tools or red ochre, will be poorly represented. 
This incomplete picture wouldn't matter if the 80s collections had been professionally examined or if Beaumont's thesis had been thoroughly re-evaluated. In 1993, Beaumont let me examine the 8788 collections. The provenance data from directly adjacent squares in two of the trenches shows that at least on the south side of excavation 3A, maybe I'll have to go back a bit here. So this, this is the south side of excavation 3A, Beaumont's 70s trench. At least on the south side of excavation 3A, the youngest 1970s Petersburg member which was at the acronym of 1GBS, grey-brown sand, cross-cut both of the resolved late Pleistocene Petersburg members, fourth brown sand and fourth, white, and fourth white ash. Fourth white ash was the one I was talking about earlier beneath. And the terminal middle Pleistocene deposit of fifth brown sand. And in the forward rows, basal complex A cross-cut fifth brown sand and underlying fifth white ash. My non-professional observations on, on, on these collections confirm and amplify the findings when you separate out Beaumont's two 1970s excavations. So this is a raw material profile, whereas in Beaumont it looked as if there was no change until the final unit, which he said was equivalent to 4BS at that end. Actually, with the resolved data, you can see that the increase in finer grained materials, of fine quartzite and chalcedony, goes all the way back through fourth white ash, so all the way back through the earlier late Pleistocene. Late Pleistocene. That, that these, the chalcedony was coming from 15 kilometers away. Second, the most pronounced increase in formal tools occurs between the fifth white ash and the, and the fifth brown sand, somewhere between 200 and 170,000 years ago, long before any raw material change. A more detailed examination of three squares of 5BS material in 2016 confirmed the presence of bifacial points, suggesting a correlation with back OB, also supported by the average length of blades. Third, and most importantly for my purposes, 5BS showed a pronounced increase in pigment use. This shows Petersburg pigment, relative pig frequencies of pigment as percentages of the combined lithic and pigment assemblages. Basal 6BS, older than 230,000, provided almost 10,000 lithics from 18 squares and just one pigment. a quite dense, relatively soft piece of hematite. Now this is borderline archaeological visibility, but it's consistent with the single pieces Beaumont reported from his two basal aggregates, BACO D and BACO A, BACO D in 3, 3B and BACO A in 3A. This is the BACO D piece, a much more chemically weathered expression of hematite, but clearly specular on the fresh surfaces. The overlying fifth white ash, with dating estimates of 227 and 183,000, provided a similar sized lithic assemblage and just three pieces of pigment from 17 squares. This is a large chunk of hard, dense, ore grade hematite. At 51 grams, it's by far the largest piece in the whole sequence, making weight-based comparisons between members inappropriate. The youngest middle Pleistocene layer, fifth brown sand, provided inverted dating estimates of 145 and 160,000, the height of the penultimate glacial. The relative frequency of 0.16% is a five-fold increase over fifth white ash. Pigments were encountered in almost half the examined squares. Although there's a greater range of expressions, it still all looks like hematite. 
albeit mostly chemically weathered to greater or lesser degrees. The late Pleistocene members, fourth white ash and fourth brown sand, provide similar percentages. Fourth white ash provided the first intensively ground pieces that might be characterized, ca categorized as crayons, having convergent facets. Fourth brown sand provided the only non-red pigment. This is about 77,000, a piece of manganese. No high quality hematites are known in the local or regional environments. The most probable source is the Makonjwe Mountains, straddling the border between Northeast Eswatini and South Africa's Mpumalanga <laughs> province. Within this ancient mineral rich zone lies Nguenya Mountain or, and Bonvu or Red Ridge, some 140 kilometers northwest of Border Cave. This is Peter Beaumont in the 60s excavating Lion Cavern. In a cliff face on Bonvu Ridge is the Adit mine of Lion Cavern, the oldest mine in the world. When mining began here is unknown, but in 1969 the bottom layers provided Petersburg type tools and an infinite radiocarbon date of 47,000. The miners were targeting a localized specular expression of hematite. Similar geology outcrops slightly to the southeast, but not much closer to Border Cave, still at least 120 kilometers. Comparing the Lion Cavern example with Peter's Bako D piece, I think you'll agree that there's a family resemblance. To put this in perspective, the only comparable inferred transfer distance for any ESA or MSA material in southern Africa is the Forestsmith specularite from Canteen Copy, thought to have come from a, about 170 kilometers away. So, I draw two main conclusions from the Border Cave pigment record. First, in a regional geological setting apparently lacking high quality pigments, early Homo sapiens, around a quarter of a million years ago, imported such materials over 120 kilometers. Second, sometime between 200 and 170,000 years ago, there was a relatively rapid and pronounced increase in red ochre use. The pattern was repeated in both 1970s trenches and in the 1980s excavation. This offers a possible time frame for similar observations made 60 to 70 years ago at Mulu's Cave and Cave of Halfs. A fourth Petersburg site, Bushman Rock Shelter, will shortly provide a test of this pattern and its chronology. This is another site I happened to look at in 93, 94, and again briefly in 2013. I've revert here the timelines transpose. This is the oldest layers, and that's the younger. We've ju they've just had dates from here of about uh, 100,000. And Carl Butzer, the geomorphologist who tried to date on geomorphological grounds Border Cave, also had a go at this site. And he thought that this layer, layer 31, was middle Pleistocene. And I think that the, the current team working there are going to confirm that. Recall that exotic procurement was considered a proxy of competition between coalitions and was predicted to associate with the irregular to regular shift. Taking the Van der Ver canteen copy and border cave evidence together, regional and exotic procurement appears to have begun considerably earlier associating with late Forest Smith and early MSA contexts. But this doesn't seem to challenge the model in any fundamental way. So to the overall conclusion, contrary to recent reviews, there is spatial and chronological patterning to the Southern African MSA before 130,000. Mason's 1950s observations stand up to scrutiny. <coughs> 
and much of the cultural evolution he identified occurred in the late Middle Pleistocene. This should come as no surprise, but technological evolution is unlikely to be particularly informative about our speciation. Perhaps more relevant is that in their perched positions, neither Mulu's cave nor Border Cave provide evidence of earlier Petersburg occupation, suggestive of a significant change in logistical organizational abilities. Pigment use did not appear, first appear in the middle of the Petersburg, as Mason and Tobias thought, but they identified a significant quantitative change to more regular use within the Petersburg. All dated shelter sites in southern Africa younger than 170,000 show regular ochre use. Earlier than this, and the patterns more mosaic. So this bears out what we predicted 25 years ago. It suggests our speciation was absolutely conventional in evolutionary terms, comprising a suite of morphological, genetic, and behavioral changes, the most significant of which being that group ritual using earth body paints, red earth body paints or cosmetics, became a matter of habitual performance and that this happened relatively rapidly. This permits the more abstract inference that symbolic culture involving some form of blood symbolism had become an evolutionary stable strategy. Across vast landscapes, people were able to refer to shared fictions and treat them as objective facts similar to the gods, dragons, and rainbow snakes we're familiar with. So our speciation, while gradual and conventional on the one hand, was also revolutionary in its final stages, both in tempo and finally stabilizing a new kind of information and information transmission. Finally, it has to be noted that across the diverse Bushman cultures of Southern Africa at the time of European contact, the most universal context in which various forms of red pigments and blood symbolism occur was in a girl's first menstruation ritual. This had the most invariant syntax of all Bushman rituals, essentially a performance of wrong species, wrong sex, wrong time, which I'm sure Camilla will talk about on another occasion. Thank you. Thank you.